This is a Data General Micronova mini computer that is nearly 50 years old and I am restoring every component of it back to working condition. Fresh off of reveling in my success of repairing the RAM access in the computer itself, I turned my attention to trying to actually use the machine, which meant it was finally time to try booting the floppy that came with my computers. And it works, but it's useless. Now, I'm skipping a few things here that I'll come back to in a future video, but to make a long story short, the only thing on that floppy is the bootloader. I needed to build my own set of floppy disks to use the computer, and I ran into an issue when attempting this. The second floppy drive can't write data. That wouldn't be a huge issue for most computers, because normally I can just boot from the drive that can only read and write with the other one, but Data General is weird, and the OS for this computer constantly writes to even the install boot disk. It's not even possible to boot a floppy if it's write protected. So even though I was finally able to use the computer itself, it still wasn't usable as a system, and I needed to fix the second floppy drive. This failure of the floppy drive is even more evil than I've let on so far. Not only is the drive half working because it can read, the error is actually intermittent. Sometimes it works and can write, and sometimes it doesn't. On top of that, it has an unrelated issue with the track zero position micro switch. As I'm writing the script, I'm not even sure if I've fixed that problem. It just hasn't come back for a while now. I've doused the switch with deoxid and blasted it with compressed air a couple of times now. I don't want to try replacing it because it is critical to the alignment of the drive, and realigning these drives could be a nightmare. The intermittent write problem, though, took weeks to finally track down and solve, because right when I would be on the heels of a solution, it would just start working again. And I was distracted by my Dasher terminal dying in the middle of this as well, which I repaired in a different video. The frustrating intermittent issues, though, would ultimately end up being the thing that led me to the solution, but getting there was a long and circuitous path. These floppy drives are part of the Data General 6039 drive enclosure. Functionally, this drive is identical to a 6038 unit. The only difference is that the 39 has a second drive installed. Now, all of the drives that are used with the Micronova are unique to it because of how they interface with the machine. This means Micronova-specific documentation is required for knowing how to use and configure these drives. Unfortunately, there is no preserved documentation for the 6038 or 39. Long after this repair, I did actually find some information about the jumpers on the massive logic board in there, and I found it in the OS install manual of all places. But that's it. The only options are to swap the drive IDs and configure the drive enclosure boot ID. So there was nothing of use there anyway. Now back to the repair, I was already somewhat familiar with how the drive was built since I brought up the power supply externally and reformed all of its capacitors in a previous video, but I hadn't lifted the massive logic board yet. The first thing I wanted to do as part of my diagnosis was swapping the drive data cables. This would tell me where the problem is. If the right side drive still couldn't write after swapping them, then the problem was in the drive. If the left side drive couldn't write, then the problem was with the massive logic board. I really wasn't sure which it would be before this test. The OS was throwing an error about it being unable to write, but the right lock LED was going out correctly on the logic board. This meant that the right lock signal from the floppy drive logic was working correctly. A side note about that, the right lock is enabled when there is a hole in the 8 inch disc, so you have to cover it to be able to write. The optical sensor in the drives for the 6039 ended up being super powerful, and the only way I was able to properly block it for writing was by putting metal EMI shielding tape on it. So weirdness with the right sensor was something I was very well aware of, but I'd already tested it and it was fine. With that in mind, I lifted the giant logic board, which turned out to be on a strange hinge system that can prop the board up to get access to the drives. I did this to get some more slack on the cables when I swapped them, and I was finally able to test if it was the drive or the board. And the problem stayed with the drive. So I now knew where I needed to look. The right floppy drive was bad. When I first started working on the Data Generals, I was under the impression that the drives in it worked like the Apple II or the Commodore PET, and that they didn't have their own logic boards. This turned out to be incorrect, and was made all the more obvious when I removed the drives and found that they are CDC BR803E models. Even though these drives are off-the-shelf models, they aren't compatible with anything else I have. There is a standard 50-pin connector for 8-inch floppy drives, but these use something else, and on top of that, DC power is run alongside data in a single cable. 
And that's not even taking into consideration that practically every 8 inch drive uses a different AC power connector for the disc rotation motor. So I have to fix this one if I want to be able to use the machine. The uniqueness of the drive is also why I didn't try replacing the track zero switch. I can't easily connect these drives to something like a DOS PC to run existing alignment programs. I would be stuck eyeballing it and making minor adjustments while using it with the Micronova. Not a fun proposition. I ran out of time the first day before I could find anything meaningful, but I did learn a few things that made me want to take a different approach with this. I was able to find a manual for these drives on BitSavers, and it had full drive schematics, which is great and super helpful, but I cannot overstate the following. This is the worst device and set of schematics I have ever seen for trying to debug. Let's say I want to take a look at one signal on a chip. We can see the pin and reference designator on the schematic. So far, so good. Over on the PCB, though, there are no RefDes markings on it except for the connectors. Instead, there is a chip map on another page in the schematic. Okay, fine. So we take a look at the schematic, then look at the board and chip map. And now we can see... Oh, they scrubbed the part number off of the chip, so I'm not sure what it is. It's not listed in the schematic either, but we do at least have the reference designator, and that is usable in a lookup table, but it only points us to some random number. That random number points us to another lookup table, and that one tells us what the part finally is. So again, the process for trying to figure out what a pin on a chip is connected to is to look at the schematic, look at the board and chip map, look at the schematics part table, and look at the real parts table. And then finally look at the real PCB again, knowing all of the pertinent information. That is five different steps you have to constantly go through when trying to trace through things. This was awesome awful, and I immediately started trying to make sense of it by drawing rough traces of interest on an image, but it quickly became a mess of overlapping things. I finally gave in and started on a partially reverse engineered KiCad schematic and layout. I'll link this down below, but it isn't complete and I don't plan on finishing it. My goal was just to lay out the sections most relevant to my problems. I was focused mostly on the erase and write fault sections of the schematic. My first hypothesis was that the drive wasn't erasing data before trying to write and the OS was detecting this and throwing an error. But there was also a section for a write fault signal that goes back to the giant logic board. Either one could make sense, so I worked on getting both of them traced out. Even with good photos, KiCad's new awesome reverse engineering image overlay tools, and full schematics, it still took me about a week to get this partial schematic done. But after I got it done enough, I went back to the office to start working on the drive again, and the stupid thing started working on its own. So I couldn't do any debugging on it until it failed again. And to add insult to injury, this is when the Dasher terminal died. <sighs> Sometimes I really think this computer hates me. Like I mentioned, the Dasher repair can be seen in a different video, but that took me weeks as well. It was really bad, but spoilers, I got it working again. And in my triumphant tests after it was running, the stupid floppy try up and died on me again. At least this gave me a chance to get back to debugging it. But after weeks of the drive and then the Dasher stuff, I really just wanted to throw the whole thing out of a window. But it's too heavy for that, so I'll just settle for fixing it instead. I ripped apart the drive enclosure again, set up the drives for debugging again, but this time I was ready with the non-idiotic schematics and signals of interest I wanted to check. I set up my logic analyzer and started probing. Immediately, I got a great indication of the issue. The right fault signal was active. I mean, that's not good, but it's better than not having a clue of what's going on. The right fault signal is interesting. There are several possible inputs that can trip it and a latch that can hold it active. So I set up my logic analyzer to see what could be causing the issue. Amongst all the inputs, the one that seemed to be responsible was an unnamed signal coming from a chip getting right data. I started looking into what this chip does. It's a pretty clever and interesting little setup. The signal comes from a 9602, which is a dual retriggerable, resettable one shots, at least according to the datasheet. A better way to think about it, at least in this application, is a signal normalizer or a digital debounce. On the floppy drive, this receives the TTL version of the write signal that goes to the drive head. This signal would change quickly as the ones and zeros are sent to the disk. The 9602 modifies the signal by adding a decay delay that will hold the ones high for longer than they normally are. This makes the signal stay high the whole time the drive is writing data. 
After looking through the datasheet for this chip, I zoomed out my capture from my logic analyzer and found that the signal from it was pulsing rapidly, meaning it wasn't properly stabilizing the signal. Finally, a path to troubleshoot from. So my next steps were setting up my logic analyzer to see the inputs and outputs going into the 9602 to see what wasn't working right. I'm using chip clips for this, which makes it way easier to probe chips like this by safely grabbing onto all of the legs at once and giving me larger isolated pins that the probes can clip onto. After putting the chip clip on, I fired up the system again, tried to read, and it worked. I didn't capture an error. But this was still the smoking gun I needed. The only thing I changed on the system was putting the clip on the chip, and that was a strong indicator that the solder on that chip was bad. I pulled the logic board off of the drive and started looking over the pins on that chip, and sure enough, they looked bad. Fixing this is just as simple as reflowing the solder and adding a little bit of new fresh stuff. While I was in there though, hopefully for the last time, I went over the schematic again and found all of the points the track zero signal switch went through. I touched up all of those as well in the hopes that that might be the issue there as well. And now I have the bad news. After I reassembled everything and connected the drive back to the enclosure, it worked. Why is that bad? Well, that's the nature of an intermittent fault. I can think I've solved the problem all I want, but I cannot truthfully say with certainty that I did find the correct cause. I can say though that I've continued using the drive for weeks after this and that it has been flawless every time, even the track zero switch actually. So as far as I can tell, that was the problem and it is now solved. The second drive in the 6039 is now working. This is huge because as you'll see in what I'm going to make the final video in the Micronova refurb series, at least for a while, you absolutely must have two drives to properly use the computer. You can either have a floppy drive and a hard drive or dual floppy drives. I do have the hard drive, but for right now, I'm trying to keep things simple and protect the data on the hard drive. So I'm treating it as just a dual floppy machine. So without this, the computer would have been yet again stuck with no way forward but it was solved. And with that, the computer is back to being hardware functional. I'm not done though. The software is a whole other kind of problem to solve, but we're closing in on the data general Micronova being a complete and functional system. And time for the final step, adding it to the system incident log. Now this problem actually happened all the way back on March 15th. I just went and double check. That's how long has been going on. It's maddening that such a difficult error can be summarized so succinctly. <laughs> oh, there we go. The Data General 6039 with the left drive that I can now remove the bad mark indicator on is fully working. Finally. <laughs> Man, that was super annoying. That has been holding me back on getting a bootable operating system actually made for the thing. So finally I can work on that. Turns out the uh, Micronova, even though it you know can work off of floppies, is really bad at it. One floppy drive is actually not enough to use the system in floppy only. It's weird. But anyway, that is it for now. So this thing is now going to become crucial in the steps ahead of making the machine useful. So it's uh, really, really nice to finally have it fully sorted. So. If you enjoyed this video about repairing the Data General 6039, you may want to subscribe because it's going to get its time to shine now in a future video. If you want to help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon, but that's it for now, and I will see you next time.